February's public forum topic for the organization formerly known as the National Forensics League is going to be resolved. The Supreme Court rightly decided that Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act violated the Constitution. It's a fairly straightforward topic as far as what it is referring to, but actually defining that is going to take a little bit of time. Obviously, Supreme Court means Federal Supreme Court of the United States. Constitution also refers to the United States. Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act can only refer to one law. Teams can try and play fast and loose with any of these because the resolution doesn't specify, but there's no alternate specification that could really be inferred, so I'm not going to deal with alternate meanings of any words in here except for violated and rightly. So, going to look at the wording directly, going to look at some background, and going to talk about what exactly Section 4 means, and what exactly this debate boils down to for either side. So, let's start with rightly decided. Rightly decided is not a term of art. The legal term of art that would be used instead would be correctly decided. Correctly decided is a question of constitutional law, it is a question of precedent, it is a question of does this mesh with what previous cases have decided. It's probably how Pro wants to define rightly decided. The trouble with this is to figure out whether or not it's correctly decided is going to take more time than actually fits into a public forum round. No public forum speech is even long enough to read the majority of decision, concurring decision, or dissent from the case that this is based on. So when they r decided this, rightly, correctly, what have you, this was based on a case called Shelby County v. Holder, which was decided last year. Any Supreme Court case, to backtrack for a moment, is going to have the plaintiff listed first versus whoever the defendant is. If the defendant is listed as the current Attorney General, Holder in this case, then it is somebody or some municipality or some state suing the federal government, and Holder in this case as the highest ranking legal official of the government would be the one listed as defending in the case. So Shelby versus Holder is Shelby County suing because they said that the Voting Rights Act shouldn't require them to have to get pre-clearance before they could change voting laws in their county. And again, that's a fairly dense sentence, so I'm going to go through it and explain it in a little more detail. The Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965 towards the end of a fairly large group of civil rights legislation. Its main goal was to prevent future instances of and stop current instances of voter suppression mainly aimed at black voters in the American South. It was updated in 1970, it was updated in 1975, it was most recently renewed in 2006, but wasn't actually updated then. So when we're looking at the Voting Rights Act, it's split into five sections. The first section just is a bunch of things that you cannot do anymore, such as literacy tests and other common tricks in the South, which were done with the explicit stated goal of the legislatures of preserving white supremacy and preventing black voters. The second th section enables civil suits, either by individuals who have some standing because they've been wronged by municipalities or states or counties' laws, or by the Department of Justice on the behalf of any one of those. The third category is, sorry, the third section is bailing in. So basically, you can be subjected to preclearance if you've done something in the recent past which was unconstitutional, which did suppress voters along racial lines. The fourth is historical tests, and that's the one that this really revolves around, more so than any of the other sections, to a lesser extent Section 5, but we'll get there in a moment. Historical tests are saying that if you have done something in the past that suppressed minority voters, you need to get preclearance. 
and Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act is the one that actually outlines preclearance. So, in plain English, what Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act said was, if you historically were a state, or a county, or I suppose a municipality, but that doesn't particularly matter for the purposes of this debate, who used to have laws that were used specifically to suppress minority voters, if you want to make a change in your laws that decides who is allowed to vote, you have to get that cleared in Washington, D.C., either by three judges on a district court panel or by the Department of Justice. And without doing that, you cannot make changes to how people are allowed to vote or not vote, as the case may be, in elections. Supreme Court decided that formula was outdated and was punishing the states for what had been done a long time ago and wasn't actually something that reflected on the realities of those laws and those politicians who were passing those laws recently. So, the states which were covered by Section 4, but are not covered currently, are Arizona, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and Virginia. Also, some counties in California, Florida, North Carolina, and, surprisingly enough, South Dakota. So those are the areas that hadn't bailed in under Section 3, but still needed to get preclearance because of historical requirements from Section 4. Section 5 wasn't decided on one way or another in the case. Now, when I say the Supreme Court decided, it's worth pointing out the Supreme Court is not a monolithic entity. Four judges felt that Section 4 violated the Constitution. Four judges felt that Section 4 did not violate the Constitution. One judge felt that Section 4 and Section 5 both violated the Constitution. So, on a 5-4 to four decision, Section 4 was found unconstitutional. To be more precise, the formula used in Section 4 was found unconstitutional. The idea that Congress can force certain states to get preclearance was not. The idea that it, you can keep a formula that hasn't been changed since 1975 was. So if I'm arguing this from the pro side, I'm probably going to talk a lot about the age of the requirements. I'm probably going to talk a lot about another previous Supreme Court case called Northwest Austin v. Holder, which was in 2009, and made a much narrower ruling on the Voting Rights Act, in which the Supreme Court basically warned the Department of Justice and indirectly warned Congress, if you don't update this sometime in the next few years, we're probably going to find it unconstitutional the next time it comes up to us, the next time we have a relevant case that we can grant cert to. So when you're looking at the pro side of this debate, you're looking mainly at precedent, you're looking mainly at alternate ways that the same thing could be done. Basically saying, look, we warned you, you didn't do anything, now it's Congress's problem. If you want to update this, you need to do it through Congress. We're not going to keep this same old outdated formula as it was. The con side of the debate can argue against this directly. If they do, it's basically going to come down to one side arguing what the majority decision said, and one side arguing what the dissent said. The dissent in this case was written by Justice Ginsburg and talks about how the fact that these preclearances are working is not a reason to get rid of them. The analogy that she used was it's like throwing away your umbrella in the middle of a rainstorm because you haven't been getting wet. And what Ginsburg meant by that was, yes, these districts haven't had histories of racist voter suppression recently because of this law. That's proof that the law is working and should be kept as is. Obviously, five justices disagreed with that. They said that even if that law is responsible for some of it, we need to adapt to conditions on the ground. We need to have laws that reflect on things that have happened between 1975 and now. We can't 
keep punishing states for having been in the Confederacy long, long time ago. The other thing that Pro is going to focus on is legislative remedies, saying if we really want to keep voting laws in a certain way, then we can still have Congress do that. The Supreme Court did not close the door on other kinds of regulation for voter registration laws. All they did was say you need newer registra you need newer laws regulating registration, newer laws regulating voting. So bills could be passed in Congress that would go through and I'm sure would certainly go through very quickly and very smoothly in the spirit of full cooperation, no filibusters that marks this current Congress, but that's a different story entirely. There is actually a bill which, at least in name, is bipartisan, which is designed to restore some of this, and that's Sensenbrenner, Conyers, and Leahy have sponsored a bill. Sensenbrenner being the token Republican on the bill, who's going to have a really hard time getting support from his own party, Conyers and Leahy being two Democrats who were fairly incensed with the Supreme Court decision in the first place. If this bill were to pass, it would be a substantially weaker version of the original Section 4 that would explicitly exclude voter ID laws or basically give a certain number of strikes over the past 5 to 15 years, after which someone could find themselves on the list requiring pre-clearance. But it wouldn't base it at all on anything going back farther than that in history. So violations of the Voting Rights Act would functionally expire for a stay and they would be back on their own recognizance, back on their own oversight, rather than regulated by the Department of Justice. So far we've talked a lot about what Pro is going to say on this topic. And what Pro is going to say is fairly straightforward. It's not a whole ton of arguments Pro can make unless they want to purposefully create clash by giving themselves additional stuff they have to defend. For instance, Pro could go farther and take a hardcore federalist stance and say that other parts of the Voting Rights Act are unconstitutional as well, but that doesn't really gain them much of anything because the topic still asks about whether the decision that Section 4 was unconstitutional was right or not. Anyhow, Khan has a few more options, a little bit more diversity in terms of their arguments here. One thing that Khan can do is argue that rightly is a question of morality rather than a question of constitutionality or a question of precedence. Khan can argue that the Supreme Court cannot rightly decide anything if either the process it uses to decide it is corrupt, or if someone else would be better off deciding it instead of the Supreme Court. So even if they decided it correctly according to stare decisis, they did not act rightly decide it, they did not morally decide it, is an argument that can be made on the Khan side. Another argument that Khan can make, aside from just echoing the dissent in this case, would be talking about how they didn't decide that it actually violated the Constitution. They decided that the formula used was outdated, but that another law, which also put requirements on preclearance, would be constitutional and would be okay. That one's a bit more of a stretch. It's going to catch some pro teams by surprise, but the wording of the actual decision implies that that argument is probably not going to be that useful against good teams in later rounds, simply because explaining the distinction between the two is very hard, especially as the currently existing formula in Section 4 was explicitly found unconstitutional. Overall, the con team's arguments are also going to have empirics on their side, in terms of what the various states that used to need preclearance but didn't after Shelby v. Holder immediately started doing in terms of laws designed to reduce the number of minority voters on the rolls. Some of which have explicitly come out and said, if we pass this voter registration law, it will reduce the number of people who vote blank. Or this is going to guarantee that this state goes to governor blank. And you've actually seen fairly explicit statements like that coming out. Generally speaking, these are backed by the that we need to do anything possible to prevent voter fraud in person, 
rather than focusing on voter suppression. It's a little bit harder for pro to argue empirics, but pro is arguing more abstract principles anyway. They're saying even if you think that everything Khan says is bad is actually bad, this is something that ought to be done through the cooperation of both parties in both branches of Congress, and a new formula should be made that does all the good things the old formula did, but in a way that's fair based on what's going on with current actions. And that sounds very reasonable, especially if you're able to break it down for a judge in the short period of time that you have in the round. The issue is going to be when Khan challenges Pro to show intent versus execution. And I think that's one place where I talk with having empirics on their side that Khan can actually pull ahead in this debate. I think Khan's two big advantages are flexibility in terms of what kinds of arguments they can make, and just looking at empirics since this decision has come to pass as far as what people on both sides of the court predicted would play out in these laws in these different regions. Obviously, Pro can also play defense fairly effectively with the other sections of the Voting Rights Act. They can say, well, if a law is really bad and it affects someone negatively, that person will have standing to sue under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Or they can say, well, these still have to go through local courts, they still have to go through state courts, they still have to go through some kind of scrutiny, and challenges to these can get people bailed in under Section 3. There's still ways to have preclearance. Preclearance was not found unconstitutional, and even if it were, then that they would still have to get them cleared after they were passed if there was a legal challenge to them. They wouldn't have to get permission before they implemented the law, but they would need to get permission to keep the law. So there's three different levels of checks, even without Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. Khan's argument is a little bit more black and white here. It's, even if there are all these other checks, it doesn't matter. The principle of the thing is that we need to prevent voter suppression in any instance that we can. We need to reject the notion that politicians should be able to pass laws that will stop people who would vote against them from voting. And that if something can reduce voter suppression, it's important to do it now. Waiting one election, letting a group of voters get suppressed for one election is bad enough for the principle in and of itself, but it's also bad because it puts a party in power who can draw district lines how they want, who can make new rules about voting how they want, and who can keep pushing back with more barriers to prevent actual progress once they get one foot inside the door. So it's kind of an argument of any instance of this must be rejected on the con side versus we have many other checks and balances that can solve for this, but that take recent history instead of ancient history into account on the pro side. That's where the bulk of the clash on this is going to be. If you have questions on the topic, by all means, feel free some of them will seem kind of basic, but they'll still be good questions. Some of them you may answer yourself in your reading from some of the articles that will be at the end of this. But even so, if you have the question, odds are someone else does as well. I'm probably going to do at least one follow-up on this topic, just looking from a little more basic level at what goes into challenging a law, how it gets to the Supreme Court, what it means for the Supreme Court to find for or against someone, what correctly decided actually implies, and a lot of other stuff that some people who have debated about Supreme Court cases before will be familiar with, but other people could either use a refresher on or are new to. Aside from that, if I do another analysis on this topic, it is probably going to be talking more about the less direct arguments and more of the arguments in terms of framing and goals, the kinds of arguments people are making on this in terms of social justice, the kind of arguments people are making on this in terms of states' rights, and the other behind-the-scenes issues that you might want to try and crystallize a final focus around. If either of those sounds interesting to you or you have questions about either of them, again, please let me know. Hope this helps, and I will see you all on this lovely, wonderful, not at all boiling down to one dissent 
versus one concurrence, one majority opinion topic.